Good morning, Riverfront. We are starting a new series this morning that Pastor Ben and I are really excited about, and it's called Enough Already, Finding Hope at the End of Your Rope. And I know it's kind of a cheesy rhyme. Forgive us for the cheesiness. We can blame Pastor Ben for that one. Um, But we actually had another series planned that we were going to do, and we ended up scrapping it at the last minute because what we have been hearing from many of you in our Zoom calls and in emails and in text messages is that people are tired. A lot of us operated on adrenaline for the past six months, and now we are moving into a new season of this pandemic where we are kind of coming off of this adrenaline rush that we might have had um, from March through the summer. Um, But the pandemic is still not over yet, and the weather is starting to get colder, and we are in a slump. I don't know if you all feel that. I certainly am feeling that this week. Many of us are suffering. Many of us are in pain, whether it be physical pain or emotional and mental health pain and distress. So I want to go to the Old Testament and I want to go to the perfect book to talk about when we talk about suffering and that is the book of Job. This book is all about suffering so hopefully it'll help us out a little bit. Let's let's see if, if Job can help us out. So Job is this righteous man who does everything right and One day, God is basically bragging about Joel to Satan like an annoying parent would brag about their perfect goody-two-shoes child. And we read in Joel uh, chapter 1, verse 8, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear for no- fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. So basically Satan is saying like, well, it's easy to be faithful to God when you have everything you want. And he says, but now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has. He will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. So this book in the Old Testament, this the book of Joel, sorry, I'm saying Joel and I meant Job, so forget everything I said about Joel, I don't know why I'm saying that, Job, the book of Job in the Old Testament was written to answer the question, what do we do with the pain that we are experiencing? What do we do when things aren't going the way that we want them to be going. And many scholars believe that Job is actually, was actually written before the book of Genesis. It's one of the very, very oldest, most ancient books that we have in the Old Testament. And I think it's really cool to think that Job might have been written before Genesis because it means that ancient people wanted to know why do we suffer even more than they wanted to know why do we exist. And that is because to be human is to suffer. And that was true thousands and thousands of years ago, and it is true today. It is part of the human condition. And a lot of us are feeling that right now. People are dying. People are sick. People are victims of racism and racist systems. Many of us know people who have gotten really sick from COVID or have been laid off, or maybe we've been laid off. Maybe we're depressed. Maybe we're stressed about our kids. Maybe we're wondering how our marriages are going to survive COVID. We are lonely. Each of us, no matter what your family situation is, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're an empty nester or a parent of young children, Each of us is dealing with some unique pain. One of our board members put it best last week at our Monday board meeting. We do check-ins at the beginning of the meeting. 
And she said, you know, at, at any given moment, I feel like I could either scream or burst into tears. And I thought, yeah, that's how I feel too. And it's hard because there's no one enemy. As much as we want to blame everything that's going on on one person or one thing, we can't. There is no one enemy. There really isn't. It is systemic, the issues that are causing a lot of us to suffer right now. And scripture tells us that we experience pain and we experience suffering because God likes to make bets with Satan, right? (laughs) Just kidding. But what we read in Job is that God is pretty vindictive and, and maybe God has a gambling problem that he's making up there making bets with Satan. If we read it literally, then yes, that is the explanation. If we read scripture literally, we see God as the God of punishment. And it can be tempting right now to say, oh, God is is punishing the world for uh, the fact that we're destroying the environment or for racism or fill in the blank, whatever whatever, uh, wrongs people have done. This COVID pandemic could feel like some sort of cosmic punishment and I, I've heard people say that and I've even joked about it like maybe maybe this is the end of times that that uh, that we hear about in Revelation but obviously that's only if we take scripture literally. Ancient people had an image of a punishing God and maybe maybe you do too. Um, people have seen God this way throughout the ages. May, maybe you grew up with an image of a punishing God. You know ancient people believed, that God flooded the entire world just because of how badly people were messing it up. And and he he literally killed everybody in the entire world except for two people because of what we had done as humans. Remember after the Haitian earthquake when the evangelical televangelists were saying that the reason for the Haitian earthquake uh, was because our country started giving full human rights to gay people? Remember that? People have always tried to blame suffering on a punishment from God. At my sister's church in Brooklyn, Forefront Church, they have a saying, and I'm totally stealing it uh, for Riverfront because it is so uh, perfect for our church's theology and for Pastor Ben and Pastor Jen's and my theology. And that is that here at Riverfront, we take the Bible so seriously that we cannot take it literally. Here at Riverfront, we take the Bible so seriously that we can't always take it literally. Our scripture is written by people who are imagining and reimagining God throughout the ages. And we have to recognize that this punishing view of God, it actually comes from Near East mythology. In Near East mythology, there were a number of gods And they would always talk to each other and they would argue back and forth just like what we see God and Satan doing in the book of Job. And some of them were nice and some of them were angry, vindictive warriors. And the writers of the Old Testament were part of this culture and so they told this story in that framework. But we know based on Jesus Christ and the life and the person of Jesus Christ, that our God is not angry and she's not a vindictive, punishing God. When bad things happen, we ask the question, is this, is this fill in the blank, COVID or the Breonna Taylor decision or whatever it might be, is this still part of God's plan? Is my loved one's death, my job loss, my miscarriage, my failed marriage? Is this part of God's plan? And when we ask these questions, people, and I'm sure you've heard this, will say to us those five most annoying words that you get when something bad happens to you. And that is, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. Don't worry. Or a variation of that in Christianese, God has a perfect plan. I can't even 
count the number of times I have heard one of those two phrases in response to something bad happening to me or to somebody else. Countless, countless times I've heard one of these two phrases. But here's the thing. Christians talk a lot about God's perfect plan. We hear this a lot. But perfection is actually not in Scripture. I promise. Look it up. Perfection is not in Scripture in that sense. God does not promise us that things are going to be perfect. God does not promise us that we are going to be spared from chaos. So if perfection isn't in the Bible, then you might wonder, where do we get this idea that's so prevalent in Christian culture that everything that happens is part of God's perfect plan? Well, the idea of perfection actually comes from Greek mythology. Christianity happened right around the same time that Greek culture was really taking off and Greek culture was becoming very popular. And the Greeks were obsessed with this idea of perfection. If you think about those beautiful Greek statues you might have seen um, with, with these men and women with kind of like the perfect faces and the perfect bodies. Or you think about the Olympics. The Greeks created the Olympics around the idea of um, celebrating the perfect athlete. Greek culture strived for perfection. It, it worshipped perfection. And since Christianity came out of this culture, we later have attributed this value of perfection to God. We've said things like, this world is not perfect, but God is making it perfect. And that's why we also in, in the United States are constantly seeking perfection in our culture. You know, we read self-help books and we're obsessed with having the perfect body or perfect face or, or perfect whatever it might be. Um, but, but perfection is just as much of a mythology as that angry warrior vindictive God. These are both competing mythologies that came out of the era in which Christianity and, and Judaism uh, grew from. Even though God does not promise perfection, God does promise life in full, which is different from perfection. God doesn't want us to live perfectly, but God does want us to live a full life. God is not angry. God does not need thousands of people to die or to be sick to accomplish some perfect plan. God is always working to help us bring flourishing to places where there is not flourishing. And how do we know this? I didn't just make this up, I promise. We know this from the life of Jesus, who is our greatest source, our greatest window into the heart of God, into who God is. If you want to know about the character of God, you look at Jesus. Because the Bible has all kinds of conflicting things, right? We have the vindictive God, the punishing God, the God who's seeking perfection. All different interpretations of God written by people who are imagining and reimagining who God is. We believe that the best way, the litmus test for all of this, and the, and the best way to figure out who God truly is, is by looking at the life of Jesus Christ. And there's a story in the book of John about the life of Jesus that really helps shed light onto this topic of suffering and why we suffer. And if you're following along, this, this story is in John chapter 9. And John says this, As he went along, Jesus, he saw a man who was blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. So basically the disciples are asking God, why did God will this to happen? Did this man's parents do something wrong? Why is he blind? And I think it's really important to, know, to note that the punishment 
wasn't the blindness, right? It wasn't because this man wasn't able to see through his eyes that, that they were saying that God has punished him. The punishment was, that, was what it meant to be blind in this culture. In this culture, if you were blind, you were a second-class citizen, you were not allowed into the temple, you were told that you were cursed from birth, and you were just treated very, very poorly. So it was really the, the culture that was the punishment, the cultural response to blindness, not the blindness. So they're saying, what, what, did, what did he do to deserve this? What Did his parents do something wrong and God, and God punish them? And this kind of stuff happens in modern society too. Autism went undiagnosed for several years, and there are many adults who are now in their 60s or 70s who were never diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder as a child because in, in those days, in the 1940s and 1950s, mothers were blamed for their children's differences. They were called refrigerator mothers, and there was this societal shame in having a child who had differing abilities than what we quote unquote call normal children. When there is no explanation for something, people want to blame somebody, right? And of course, we always blame the moms. And it was the same in Jesus' day with this blind man. And Jesus responds to this. He says, this is in, in verse 3, if you're following along, he says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Okay, so when I first read this, I was like, wait, so what you're saying is, is that all this had to happen. This man had to be born with no sight and then he had to suffer and be treated as a second-class citizen and had all this persecution. Like, all this had to happen just so that God could do something? That still doesn't square with um, the God that I know or the, or the God that I, that I would want to follow. And this particular translation and this particular passage is an example of why English often fails us in the Bible, right? Because the Bible was not written in English and all of the scripture that we read, most of us who are not Hebrew or Greek scholars, um, are translations. And so we need to look at a different translation to get at what Jesus really meant in this passage. And Eugene Peterson is... Um, is the interpretation that I read and the translation that I read that really made me think like, yes, this is what Jesus is trying to say here. And Eugene Peterson says this. He says you can translate uh, th this Greek in, in this translation. Jesus said, you are asking the wrong question. You are looking for someone to blame. There is no such cause and effect here. Look instead for what God can do. So you are asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame, but this isn't a cause and effect situation. Instead, instead of answering the question of who caused this, look instead for what God can do in this situation. So what Jesus is saying is that my prayer and your prayer should be, God, show me the way that you are at work in the midst of this pandemic. God loves us so much that she gave us free will. And so bad things are going to happen. It's not because God is angry. It's not because it's part of God's perfect plan. This is just what's going to happen when you have a bunch of free agents all doing our own thing in this world. And what God is saying here is that when we ask the age-old question of why do bad things happen, we're actually asking the wrong question. Instead, God says, look and see the ways that I am at work in this suffering. I don't want this pain, but I can work with you to bring fullness in the midst of it. So Jesus heals the blind man. And when he does this, the religious leaders, people like me and people like Pastor Ben and Pastor Jen, the religious leaders get really mad. And the reason they get mad is because they think, you know, we thought we knew the heart of God. And we were convinced that God was punishing this man. We thought we knew it. We thought we knew one thing. 
We knew that this man was blind because he was a sinner. That's our truth. And in response to them getting mad, Jesus says, this is in verse 39, he says, I came into the world to bring everything into the clear light of day, making all the distinctions clear, so that those who have never seen will see, and those who have made great pretense of seeing will be exposed as blind. I love that, great pretense of seeing. How many people do you know who have made a great pretense of seeing? I can think of a few. He says those who have made this great pretense of seeing will be exposed as blind. That's the upside down kingdom that I always talk about. Jesus is saying we're the ones who can't see here. When we try to ascribe motivation to God or attach our suffering to her, we are missing the whole thing. We're missing the whole thing. God is not bringing perfection to your life, but God will bring fullness. Fullness. Fullness looks like the McCoys having their sweet little baby Ripley in the middle of the pandemic and people offering to bring meals to them. Fullness looks like our little church raising thousands and thousands of dollars for our Jericho Road Fund to help people who've been hit hard by this pandemic. Fullness looks like two new churches being planted by former Riverfront members in the middle of an international pandemic. Fullness looks like backyard church, and it looks like our Riverfront kids seeing each other for the first time in six months and doing sidewalk chalk and blowing bubbles and picking up like nothing happened and, and that there's nothing bad in the world. Fullness is not perfection. It's not. Many of you know that our daughter Sahana, who's our oldest, she was our first baby. We were matched with her when she was two months old, but she was the last ch child to join our family. She came home um, when Theron and Nevi and Dianan were already in our family. And the reason for that is because shortly after we finalized her adoption in Congo, the president of the Congo refused to let any children leave the country for political reasons. And so we were forced to keep Sahana in foster care for another year and a half during an incredibly formative time in a child's life developmentally from, you know, when she was under one all the way until she was two and a half. And so obviously, if you can imagine what it would be like to have one of your children in foster care, this was excruciatingly painful for us. It was an excruciatingly hard time. And when this was happening, I remember my mom saying to me, you know, I hope one day you'll be able to look back and find joy in this season of waiting. And it really pissed me off at the time. I thought she was crazy and it made me really angry that she would say that to me when I was suffering. But eventually Sahana came home after we were placed with Theron and after I gave birth to twins. And she was the best big sister ever like in the i'm a little biased but like in the history of big sisters sahana is the best akka which is what we say for big sister she's the best akka and i can see that god totally made her to be the big sister of a big family and when i look back on that season now i still feel pain and I still believe that, that that was not the way that things should have been. I mean, adoption is not the way that things should be, right? Children should be allowed to grow up, um, should be able to grow up in, the, in their biological families. And I still grieve, and I still, um, I still think about all that she has lost. But there is some joy. My mom was right. There is some joy. There is joy and fullness in who our family is today. And joy isn't a feeling of happiness. I, I still don't feel happy about how that all went down. But joy is what happens when we come through the pain and we have eyes to see that God's hand is at work, even when things are not the way that they're supposed to be. God is constantly working to bring flourishing in spaces where there wasn't flourishing before. God doesn't want pain. And God doesn't want perfection either. 
God wants fullness and God wants flourishing, which happens in between pain and perfection. How is your life being made full? Right now, right now, where you are, can you identify one area of fullness in your lives today? Maybe a moment or maybe something even bigger. As we move into this week, let's commit to noticing those hard-won moments of fullness. As we follow a God who is not based on Near East mythology or Greek mythology, but is who is based on the person of Jesus Christ who we follow. A God who says, you are asking the wrong question in response to our attempts to understand suffering. A God who is constantly at work in your life and in mine to bring fullness even in the hard. Amen.